Live from the Orion Cygnus arm of the Milky Way galaxy, this is Scientifically Speaking, a weekly half-hour program devoted to elegant curiosities, and I am one of your hosts, Sarah Chang, and joining me, as always, is Bernie Grime, DJ Star Watcher. How are you, Bernie? Yes, hi, Sarah. Pretty good. Thank you. Bernie's our professor of the Astronomy Lab at USM and our local protector of the night skies. Reach out to us at WMPG Scientifically Speaking at gmail.com or on Twitter at WMPG SciSpeak. And if you miss this show or any of your other favorite shows and want to catch um, the archive, you can go to WMPG.org. Bernie, could you let our listeners know what is up in the night sky for this coming week? Okay, certainly. So today is Friday, March 5th. So we have a last quarter moon, which is good because it comes up around midnight. That'll give you some time to look at other things without the moon being in the way. Uh, so basically, there's not that much left to see in the evening sky. Mars will be the only planet that'll be left. And if you'd like to get up early, you can see Jupiter and Saturn. They've switched places since that nice conjunction that they had back on the winter solstice a few months ago, because we're heading into spring now. But there, so they'll be up in the morning sky. And we lost Venus, so that's not going to be back for a little while still. So that's basically it. Kind of not a real exciting week, but, you know, a couple planets are still hanging around, so you can see them. <laughs> well, that's that, that just so nice of them. <laughs> yeah, right. It's so nice of them. <laughs> what was that, Seth? Oh, sorry. I was just saying it's oddly fitting that Mars is the last planet standing. <laughs> oh, that's right. With all the missions going there. Actually, some of them would have landed by now. Yeah, that's true. Well, I, I just meant that it's named after the god of war you know it just took out all the other planets thing yeah right well actually speaking of which um this is a little off topic but the chinese um uh mission to mars didn't they just fly by and they took a photo of it oh yeah that was just released um a day or two ago yeah I guess, you, <laughs> I, guess, I guess that's news to you guys. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, anyways, thank you so much, Bernie. Uh, if you could not take notes fast enough, you can also check out the monthly What's Up column in the Portland Press Herald for, uh, for all of the elegant writings of Bernie of our night sky. And bring a highlighter because there will be a quiz. <laughs> <laughs> We should we should do that. We should have yeah. a question of the week and yeah. then answer it next week. Yeah. Well, something like on Star Talk, he does a whole Cosmic Queries episode every once in a while. Oh, uh, never mind then. We'll, All we'll right, okay, we'll Star Talk. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So today's show, if you haven't already guessed, longtime listeners will have recognized that third voice peeping through the 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 sound waves there joining us the infamous seth lockman welcome to scientifically speaking hey sarah thanks good to be back well uh we'll insert some applause. <laughs> you know yeah. i i hear applause. it in my head but um then i have to actually go back and edit it in can you get me some of that like conquering hero the da 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 you know how <laughs> I think that's that's probably a good outro music. Yeah, okay, I like yeah, it. Yeah, I'll set that. I'll set that with like trumpets and everything. Yeah, yeah. So, tons of accolades, cheering, and coverage from the Portland Press Herald, The Observer, Space News, The Associated Press, Space.com, and the BBC. Mhm. Mm yeah. All I'm going to I'm going to credit you. I mean, obviously, it's it's the work of your whole team, but um, you left our show to be with Blue Shift, and you are now their communications director. And I want to credit you <laughs> for all of that amazing coverage. I assume that's that's your job as a communications director is to to network with these outlets. That is one of my many responsibilities. Uh, but yeah, it was a, it was a team effort. Um, uh, our, our, our PR consultant, but a Stuttart was uh, of terrific help, and uh, especially on the national level. And then, of course, Sasha was just brilliant, um, you know, getting him in front of everybody to, to give interviews. I'm sure he was, uh, he, he seems like the kind of person who just loves to talk, though. <laughs> if you give him the, uh, Is he the opportunity. Now? <laughs> Yeah, 
no, he's great with the camera. He's 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 great over the phone. Um, he he just he just gives a good interview. Yeah. So yeah. you just got to do all the groundwork of making it all, setting yeah. it all up, and he'll yeah, show exactly. Me. I kind of have to uh, kind of onboard people, you know, after, after after the basic vetting, I'm like, okay, he's, you know, CubeSat, suborbital, orbital, you know, bio drive fuel, made in Maine, go. And yeah. Try off the races. That's your recipe for, for communication success. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And then on, on one or two occasions, I do have to brutally fact check. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I think there are, there will be a couple of moments in, in today where we'll, we'll fact check a couple, um, yeah. couple things here. Um, but first thing for our listeners who don't know what we're talking about, maybe they know you, but they don't know what we're talking about, or maybe they don't know you, but they know what we're talking about. Could you just give the lowdown of blue shift? Just like your brief, you know, really quick. What's your, what's your elevator? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So Blue Shift is a, uh, a, a new space nano launch startup. And uh, okay, that's, that's word salad. Let's, let's <laughs> yeah. So um, uh, you, you all know about uh, CubeSat, right? You've got a satellites are getting smaller and smaller, much like how computers used to be, you know, the size of a two story house. And now they, you know, you can fit like three or four of them in your pocket if you really tried. And in, in, in much the same way, satellites are getting smaller and smaller. You know, the space shuttle was meant to go out and recover satellites, you know, a little bit bigger than like a school bus. And uh, it's down to the point where you can get the basic function of, you know, a simple satellite down into, uh, well, theoretically 10 centimeters uh, cubed, you know, 10 by 10 by 10. Uh, realistically, it's, it's more often 10 by 10 by 30. It's kind of like the, the industry standard form factor or the three unit CubeSat. Um, and so this business is growing rapidly as the cost, especially if production comes down, um, hobbyists and, and, you know, K through 12 programs can build CubeSats for a couple hundred bucks. Uh, you can definitely also do it for a couple thousand bucks, uh, but, but you don't, you don't need to, you, you can build a satellite for cheap. Um, where things get a little tricky is launching them. That's where things get expensive and really time consuming. Um, and so what Blue Shift is going to do, we want to uh, be the, the delivery guys. We want to uh, lift 30 kilogram payloads to suborbit. So that's when you basically you go up and you come down. Um, and then there's orbit. That's where you go up and then sideways really, really fast. And uh, so we want to do both of those. We want the CubeSat customer to be the primary payload. We don't want them ride sharing with hundreds of other CubeSats. We don't want them... Uh, you know, secondary payload to some big, uh, you know, military or weather satellite or something. Um, you know, custom orbits, uh, quick, quick mission turnarounds. You know, if, if uh, you from, from calling us to launching, would be a matter of weeks or maybe months, um, as opposed to, in some cases, a matter of years. Uh, another part of the business model is our proprietary bio-derived fuel. It's non-toxic. I don't believe I can say that it's edible. Um, but in theory, you could eat it and face only minor constipation as a result. <laughs> and it probably, I'm just guessing here, probably hot sauce would be helpful. Uh, probably it's terrible. <laughs> but more important than its uh, it, m potential applications as a, as a food stuff, um, if... God forbid there was a, a, a catastrophic failure of the launch vehicle and it ended up uh, in the ocean or something, uh, it wouldn't poison the wildlife. And uh, also because of how our hybrid engine is, is designed with a solid fuel and a liquid oxidizer, the, uh, the oxidizer is not cryogenic. And so even though uh, 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 in certain liquid propellant rockets where you have liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, it's, you're really just creating water, um, we, well, it's kind of apples to oranges, but basically we don't have the carbon footprint of cooling down the oxidizer to cryogenic temperatures. So, so overall, I feel like I, I've seen Sasha throws around, but it's uh, carbon neutral. Uh, yeah, so the, the, the solid fuel, 
is very nearly carbon neutral. And that is, um, it is it is combustion. So you do get some CO2 when you operate the vehicle. Uh, but then most of that carbon dioxide is reabsorbed as you produce more fuel. Mm. Um, yeah, so in addition to not having any heavy metals or rubbers or other, you know, accelerants um, that, that would be, you know, toxic and in incidentally expensive to handle, but <laughs> also uh, toxic. Uh, so they're not in the in the motor, um, yeah. But yeah, it also uh, it absorbs CO two, and and so it was really lucky when when Sasha stumbled upon this fuel, a little when well, it was like six or seven years ago, it would have been. He found something that is cleaner than industry standard fuels and cheaper than industry standard fuels, and with a hybrid rocket, unlike with a hybrid car, a hybrid rocket means like fewer moving parts. So it's simpler, it's lighter, it's more robust. Um, assuming you can get stable combustion, which is a, a very real challenge um, that we believe we've we've solved, but we've demonstrated that we've solved it. Um, but uh, yeah, so um, basically, we want to do it uh, cheaper than the the competition and. Uh, and uh, in a more ecologically sustainable way. Yeah, no, oh, great goals. Thanks. <laughs> Sending up CubeSats, making it cheaper for them, customizing it, and then mm -hmm. doing it in an environmentally friendly way, or as much as you can. As much as we can. Um, yeah. This is going to be, in 10 years, it's going to be uh, a $69 billion industry. It's projected by Frost and Sullivan. And you're, we're talking about a brand new industry, billions of dollars yeah. that, and, and rockets. Anything that can be done to offset the carbon footprint would be really, really good. And so we're uh, excited. I mean, not only do we you know, welcome a little bit of friendly competition, but there are a lot of companies right now um, that are working on biofuels or bio-derived fuels. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's not like this is a new thing exactly because the uh, the V2 back in World War II it burned ethyl alcohol. Um, so biofuels go at least that far back. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so. Just, yeah. So we brought you on because right, right, Why fairly recently. <laughs> well, no, no, no. <laughs> Thanks for the the four one one the lowdown on Blue Shift. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's a that's a great way to kind of package up what what you guys are about. And I know since you since you decided to leave us, um, to go join this this <laughs> crazy startup. Um, you know, you guys have had great success, and you were in the R and D phase. I guess you are you you, you still are in some ways um, testing. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, but you guys had the fuel but you were working on the actual uh, rocket. Yeah, yeah. So when I, uh, when I signed on with Blue Shift just over two years ago, we were kind of wrapping up optimizing the fuel. Mm. And um, because of how complex the fuel is, it was, it was iterative. Um, we got a pretty good formulation. And I, I can't say what's in the fuel, sorry. Uh, from there, we got a NASA grant to develop the hybrid engine. And then once that was done, uh, came time to launch. And so uh, that's, that's when we kind of graduated into uh, building not just rocket engines, but the whole, the whole thing. You take that engine, kind of tie it in knots so that it fit in a fuselage. Uh, and then you need to add uh, you know, your flight computer, uh, the, the comm systems, the payload bay, um, all the cameras that uh, people have been enjoying on our social pages. Um, and, you know, of course you have to then get all the systems working in concert. And that was uh, quite quite a process. Our, uh, our two lead engineers on the project were uh, Luke Sandin and Brooke Halverson. And those guys and, and everybody who's been running sims and, and turning wrenches on the rocket is just like, like, like kudos to them yeah. because it's not often that the first flight of a, of a rocket using a new technology goes well, let alone flawlessly. Yeah. Well, um, so you guys launched Stardust 1, 1.0 or Stardust 1? 
people seem to be leaning towards Stardust One. Stardust um, One. <laughs> realistically, it's not like there's going to be, you know, Stardust One Point One Eight. <laughs> so, All right. Yeah. But I guess, uh, do you imagine that? Um, so you you guys launched Stardust One from the Loring Commerce Center up in up near Limestone in Arista County, quite up there. Um, it's very <laughs> cold right now. Yes. Uh, we're recording this a little bit earlier, but you launched in January. January, what was that? The launch itself was on the 31st. The 31st. Yeah. Yeah. So in the afternoon. Morning. Yeah. Yeah. And we know that you were trying to launch many months ago. Yes. What was, you know, you had a great successful launch on the 31st. And it was so beautiful. Came back down, parachuted back down. But why was it delayed for so long? Well, uh, the short version is that we had to get it right. Um, the team pushed themselves very hard. There was more than a couple of hundred hour weeks for everybody involved. Uh, and at the end of the day, uh, I, I promise no one wanted to launch this thing any more than we did. But if something comes up in the design process or you know, sometimes it's a shipping delay that's just is what it, it that you know has to be dealt with and usually there's kind of a cascading effect because this one thing didn't get done another thing can't get done but uh ultimately there were just opportunities to do things better and so we put in the time and uh you know could we have launched a month earlier maybe but this this flight was totally nominal this was just about perfect and and, and it was an, it was a reasonable amount of time to build a rocket of that class and remarkable considering that it was using a totally new technology in the, in yeah. the fuel. So, uh, so yeah, we had to delay a couple of times, but all things considered, um, uh, I'm, I'm really, really impressed with the result. And I think that the wait was worth it. And, uh, and I'm the guy who had to keep announcing that there was going to be more weight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, I think it was, it. <laughs> that was probably the hardest. Uh, I guess you had the hardest job in some ways. <laughs> oh my god! Number the number of people that have just been saying "when hop," which I I think means when is the suborbital launch, <laughs> at what date and time scale. But it's just you know, like W E N H O P. I was like, guys, guys, guys. <laughs> we want it too. We want to. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, the, the, the overwhelming majority of people were really, really supportive and, and incredibly understanding. Um, even uh, the first time we had to scrub, we, people were, were calling in from all, all walks of life. People that, uh, they, they just were calling to say, oh, don't worry, you know, I've, I've seen rockets scrub before and I'm with, you know, XYZ, incredibly reputable organization. You know, I'm just dropping this star power on you via email. Oh yeah, I've seen scrubs before. Don't worry about it. You'll have your time. And it was, uh, yeah, it was just an amazing outpouring of support. What a community. Yeah. A rocket launched community. <laughs> you know, we saw it a while, a couple months ago, um, uh, Rocket Labs had a, a, a catastrophic failure in flight, right? And, and uh, Jeff and Elon were reaching out over Twitter to say, oh, don't worry about it. You know, good, good try, we'll get it next time. And, uh, that everyone seemed super surprised, um, but uh, that's that's really just how the community is. Yeah. Did you uh, did you get a shout out from Elon? <laughs> Elon who? <laughs> yeah, who is? I don't know. I'm sorry, I, I, I couldn't I couldn't resist. <laughs> um, no, no. Although uh, we have we have heard from a number of uh, very prominent YouTubers, and that that was pretty that was pretty crazy. Can you name drop anyone? Um, a couple of people were saying, oh, the everyday astronaut mentioned you in a stream. So I'm checking this out now. And oh, this, so, uh, yeah. Hi, hi, Tim. Thanks. All right. We'll tag him. Okay, sweet. <laughs> um, but yeah, and then like, like NASA space flight was actually commenting on our live stream. Wow. Um, 
and I, I, I know uh, NASA wants us to be careful, so I'm not implying that any NASA or any aspect of NASA was like endorsing us or anything like that. I'm just, I'm just saying they were in the chat. Um, but that was that was really amazing to see. Yeah. And so your first launch um, back in January, you also had a small pay payload. Um, yes. You had two, two uh, organizations that um, put something up there, right? Or well, it, we had three paying customers, and then oh, we three. Had, there was one space left in the payload bay that we wound up using. So. Um, Falmouth High School sent up uh, a, a GoPro and some X in a box uh, chips to include flight data. So they had uh, acceleration, pressure, temperature, and humidity uh, sensors on board their, their vehicle. Um, and this is this was not their first CubeSat. They also um, developed the harmful algal bloom system aboard MESAT-1, which used to be Maine's first CubeSat. Now, now it's Maine's first orbital CubeSat. Uh -huh. um, so they, uh, they, they've got uh, Maine's first academic suborbital, and they were part of Maine's first orbital. Nice. So kudos to Falmouth High School. Yeah. Uh, crushing it in, in space. Uh, then uh, the Kellogg's Research Labs uh, they they ran an experiment to test the vibration dampening properties of this shape alloy shape memory alloy called nitinol, which is a mixture of nickel and titanium. So one of the problems with rocket launches is vibrations, right? Mm -hmm. um, especially when you're in the atmosphere, it's definitely worse down there. So uh, there are many many different ways to to address this issue and. It always add, adds weight usually and, and takes away from efficiency. So what they, they were thinking is let's take this, this uh, nitinol, take the vibrations of the rocket launch and just turn it into heat and then channel it out through the rocket's skeleton. Um, and I think we can do it you know, for less weight and at a better manufacturing price point. And so they, they had two one U CubeSats inside their larger three U CubeSat and technically our, the blue shift enclosure is big enough to hold a 3U CubeSat. So if, if we send you an enclosure, you can either just put a 3U in it, or you can build a slightly larger than 3U CubeSat using our enclosure and use that extra volume if you want. So either, either or. So uh, they, they kind of did both. So they had the two 1U CubeSats, one had a normal uh, uh, kind of a, a bushing, just holding it in place, and then one had a nitinol bushing. And so they were measuring which CubeSat vibrated more. Uh, and we're still waiting on their results. But uh, hopefully, the night and all uh, dampened the vibrations by about 90%. And uh, so those are our two kind of like archetypical customers. You know, we've got the academic researchers or, or, or the tech project. And we've got the manufacturer testing a new material or process. Uh, so that was really cool to see, you know, kind of the the, these uh, exemplifications of, of you know who we who we imagined getting to work with uh, signing on for our very first mission, and then and then there's Rocket Insights, uh, software developers, and uh, they came to us really excited about what we were doing, and and their partners were um, uh, had a lot of ties into Maine, and. Uh, so, so they wanted to help sponsor the launch, and you said, "Well, we've got one, you know, payload bay left here, or one one spot in the payload bay." Uh, so, what do you want to do? And they said, "Well, uh, we met some quarterly goals, and our Dutch parent company sent us a year's worth of Stroop waffles uh, shortly before everybody had to go home because of COVID, and so we just have, and they showed us like this ridiculous pile of Stroop waffles. Now, interestingly, I was looking at the boxes of Stroop waffles and I was thinking, that's about one U. Oh, that's, a, that's interesting. <laughs> and I, I, was, I was late to the party because the, the plan was already uh, in, in Dave's brain that, that we were going to just take the, the waffles, the Stroop waffles. And uh, it's like a Dutch wafer cookie with yep. uh, I think a caramel filling. Um, and they're delicious. They're amazing. Anyway, <laughs> took a, a, a pouch of Stroop waffles and put them in the CubeSat. And uh, so if you if you go to our YouTube channel, you can see on our Payload Bay cam, which 
the engineers affectionately uh, redubbed waffle can, you can <laughs> see as the engine cuts out, the stroop waffles just kind of float up. Um, and they, they get to have a few seconds of pseudo microgravity. And uh, they also kind of zigged where Kellogg's research zagged. And rather than try and dampen vibrations in their payload, uh, they decided to try and tumble some tourmaline. Maine is uh, kind of world famous for its pink and green tourmaline. And so uh, they got you know a bunch of tiny little uh, crystals. And uh, so we're, we're waiting to see how that experiment turned out. But hopefully they have that you know kind of glossiness to them that you would expect with tumbled rocks. Do, uh, do the waffles taste better? Uh, as we are recording this now, the, um, the, being the tested. waffles are on their way to the Rocket Insights team. <laughs> and so we, we have yet to, uh, we have yet to get confirmation on the, uh, on the gustatory status of the Stroop waffles. Uh, can, can they withstand the vibrations? By the looks of the payload bay camera quite well. Yes. Yeah. Cause you said that they were floating up. Yes. A little bit. And I don't know why I just imagine them just crushed, crushing, you know, being crushed on the way up, but <laughs> I it's, guess it wasn't crumbs. <laughs> they're very robust and not super compressible. Uh, yeah, I guess yeah, that so, caramel, the caramel, I think it's the caramel. Probably. There's probably <laughs> some really complex composite <laughs> material stuff going on with the Stroop waffles. I 100% would believe that. Uh, and if someone would like to model that, like call me, let's talk. <laughs> Waffle science modeling. needs this. Now, Stardust accelerated at a fairly gentle two Gs. Uh, Stardust two now is going to accelerate at about five Gs. So um, if Rocket Labs wants to run that experiment again, we might have some slightly different results uh, at, at you know significantly higher accelerations. Well, they've got a lot of samples to use, right? They certainly do. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so, uh, um, you gave one spec, the two G's that it was mm -hmm. launched at, um, what are, can you provide us some more, um, specs? How high did you go? How long was the launch? Yeah. So, um, the flight was just under two minutes. Um, we hit just about 4,000 feet above the ground and, uh, and, uh, those are the those are the two flight stats that I've got. <laughs> uh, I can I can tell you that everything else was nominal. You know the flow rates. The how much uh, um how much fuel was used? I uh, I don't have that exact number for you. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> Unprepared guess. It's okay. <laughs> Just <Not> kidding. <laughs> I cannot. I cannot. Um, I I did read in the article that it was intentionally underfueled though. So. Is that yes? Uh, we wanted to fly safe, and we want to keep the FAA happy. And so, for those two reasons, we did not fly the rocket as high as it, you know, possibly could. What uh, um, what is its max height? Uh, I don't, I don't know. Um, all I know is that we plan to hit uh, fifty two hundred above sea level, and one of our launch attempts, the igniter went off, but the main valve didn't, and so that burned through some of the fuel um, in the reaction chamber. Um, which is which is fine uh, because the main reason that we wanted originally our flight uh, our apogee was supposed to be four thousand we raised it to fifty two hundred to burn through more of the fuel so uh, as long as the fuel got burned through we're happy yeah um, yeah and so, um, last thing is this rocket reusable almost entirely so. The, uh, the rocket itself touched down gently, beautifully. Um, there are a couple of uh, basically pins holding the two sections together. Those will need to be replaced, of course. And um, the, there are these kind of tines uh, coming down on the bottom of the rocket. And their, uh, their primary purpose is to absorb shock during uh, what is, th now this is, an, this is an actual thing. NASA calls this a litho breaking maneuver. And this is when a spacecraft uh, slows down and partially or totally uh, arrests momentum uh, by um, uh, contacting the ground. And so during our litho braking maneuver, 
uh, we have uh, kind of a, a, a crumple, you know, a crush zone on the bottom of the rocket with those tines. And so those got just horribly messed up, um, oh, but wow. did their job perfectly. And um, the only thing that happened to the rocket was uh, a little bit of scratched paint. So uh, we'll, you know, we'll just turn a couple bolts, pull that off, put on a new set of tines and, and it'll be good to go. Is that um, fairly inexpensive? Oh yeah, yeah. That's, uh, I don't have an exact price on that, but it's- Why not? Your price. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding you got me you got me it yeah, turns out you're all the hard facade. questions here huh. the um, is <laughs> all right last uh last two things um yeah. first on your rocket like your four rocket products you have the stardust gen, gen one stardust mm -hmm. gen two which goes a little higher and is a longer flight time then you've got your starless rogue which yep. goes into suborbital space, um, six minutes of zero gravity, zero Gs. Yep. And then you've got your red dwarf, which is going into low Earth orbit, um, but that's got a 30 kilogram payload. The one that you just launched was the Stardust Gen 1. Are you also going to test launch all the other three? And when is the next one? Yeah, so uh, because Stardust 1 or 1.0 was totally nominal. Uh, we've decided that uh, we'll we'll keep it. Uh, we'll maybe we'll find a nice museum to park it in in, in the near future. Uh, but it's it's time for Stardust too. That um, what we might learn from flying Stardust one again is uh, not not as great as the things we'll learn by developing and flying Stardust two. So Stardust 2 is going to be a uh, single stage still. Um, it's going to have a much larger engine. Um, I, can't, I can't say how large, but it's, it's, it's going to have a little bit more kick, uh, like I was saying, 5 yeah. Gs of acceleration instead of 2. Um, and officially, uh, we've stated 40,000 feet is the, uh, the flight ceiling there, or the apogee. Uh, we're going to try for the Kármán line. And we're going to uh, get Stardust 2 just into space and then back down. Nice. It's exciting. Yeah. It is. It is. Um, and so part of that has also been we're, we're, uh, we're looking at uh, a down east launch site, a coastal down east, uh, you know, with ocean overflight. So that'll be from somewhere uh, between Bahaba and Eastport. <laughs> Sorry, East Pot. <laughs> Great accents there. Yeah, thank you. Since you're putting more satellites into space, um, I know they're not as big or as bright as the Starlink Goop. Mm -hmm. I wonder how you're um, kind of like justifying that or the use, or if you're going to be able to clean up any other satellites, or you're going to be lower Earth orbit, I guess, and they may not be up there quite as long. So I was wondering how you might um, work with that. Yeah, so those are some good questions because uh, outgassing is not the only kind of pollution we need to control. So. First of all, uh, Red Dwarf is going to launch to very low, low Earth orbits that will degrade in months to perhaps a few years at the most. Uh, this is really good for repeat business, <laughs> but also um, we, we don't want our satellites or our customer satellites interacting with uh, the orbital debris that's mostly at higher levels in the, uh, I was gonna say in the atmosphere. How, technically, the the ISS is still like in the atmosphere, right? I mean, yeah. Barely, yeah. But <laughs> um, but you know, we 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 don't want our our, our stuff going into higher orbits. Um, as for uh, keeping them dark, uh, we have a number of possible solutions on the table, and uh, it's something that I've made sure to bring to uh, a number of people that are involved with Spaceport Maine, and that. Um, you know, it's, it's not just blue shift that needs to be, uh, thinking about that. Um, and, uh, what was the, uh, what was the last point, Bernie? I'm real sorry. If there's any way that I know nothing's really been built to clean up any of the space. Junk. Right, right, right. So that wouldn't be us, although we would be very proud to launch one of those systems. Mm -hmm. Um, but we're, we're not developing any sort of, uh, 
uh, system for recovering debris from from orbit. But um, yeah, no, we'd be we'd be proud to launch a system like that. Um, we might even consider launching them into a little bit of a higher orbit so they don't need to boost themselves. Um, but uh, you know, other things that we're doing is we're we're looking at making our rocket fully reusable because at this point, uh, you know, everybody has to. SpaceX was really good about <laughs> kind of forcing the industry to go down that road. Um, and we also, uh, we don't want to uh, optimize our engines for a specific altitude. We want to come up with a single engine that works at all altitudes. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so we will probably lose some tiny amount of efficiency by, by doing that, but we're moving that efficiency over to production and uh, reducing the, the cost and the wait times and the carbon footprint of machining these engines that are super optimized to work for, and, and they're only at their maximum efficiency for like one precious instant per stage during the ascent, right? Um, so we, we're, we're not, uh, as Sasha loves to say, we're not, we're not gonna be like the F1 racing car. We're gonna be like the Corolla, the, you know, just liable. Honda Civic. Honda Civic, right, yeah, just, just you know, cheap, goes forever. <laughs> Doesn't give you a great analogy. Yeah. yeah. All right. The Honda Civics of the rocket industry. Uber just. I like, uh, yeah, I like the Uber, the Uber of the <laughs> rocket industry. Well, thank you so much, Seth, for yeah. joining us today. Check out blueshiftaerospace.com for more info and more details, and that's how you can get in touch with them. Your YouTube channel, where you mm -hmm. can find the launch, and uh, we'll share that as well, so you have a link to that. You've been listening to Scientifically Speaking here on WMPG with myself, Bernie, and Seth Lockman of Blue Shift Aerospace. Stay tuned for Sports Jam with Colin and Connor, and from your favorite nerds, mask up, and we wish you healthy bodies and clean air. Cut. Cut. All right. Cut.